I'm on the pier here in St. Lucia. We just arrived a couple of hours ago and I'm about to go on a tour. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, checks uh, with temperatures and uh, we have to show the original vaccine card in order to get off the pier. And we've been standing here for, for quite a while. I'm in group number 12 and we're being called forward now. I thought we were the last to go uh, off, uh, but uh, we were called before some of the other groups. So we're passing you. <laughs> I want to see if anybody looks angry. <laughs> How did you persuade her that we could go before them? We're just nice people. So we're just nice people, so we work together, so I guess it was like obvious that, you know. Is this the first uh, cruise ship uh, no. after the pandemic? No, no. We've been having like every other week. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah. So it's nice to be back and yeah. uh, with, with Trust people like It's Trust been boring? Me. Boring. <laughs> a, a whole year and a half you're home not doing anything and then because yeah. that's what you do. There's nothing else and then I guess a lot of people... Hi guys, this week I'm going to take you to you three different islands in the Caribbean. Oh, exactly. Two autonomous islands that are a part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And then to an independent UN nation, St. Lucia. And that's where we start. My name is Palabo. This is the Radio Vagabond, episode 220. Welcome to the Caribbean. Meet Palabo a full-time traveler and digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. At the age of 50, he made a bold decision. He sold everything, his house, his car, his furniture, and set out on a quest to visit every country in the world, documenting everything along the way. This is The Radio Vagabond. This episode is supported in part by Hotels25.com and recorded right in the middle of the pandemic in August 2021. The visit to the small island nation, St. Lucia, is a part of a 12-day cruise and because the pandemic was still around, it had a few impacts on the cruise. Everyone on the ship had been fully vaccinated and still had to present a negative COVID test so on the ship, we didn't have to wear a mask, but there were some restrictions, like there weren't a normal buffet option. It was all being served for us. Also, there were restrictions on excursions for some of the destinations on the cruise. And then the itinerary had been changed quite a bit. The original plan was that we would visit six UN nations. And since I'm one of those travelers that travel with the goal of visiting every country in the world, this was one of the main attractions for me. This trip would actually get me to exactly 100 countries. Well, that didn't happen, and I was a bit disappointed. That is what happens during a global pandemic, and it's something I spoke about in a previous episode. When you're on a cruise like this, the cruise line offers a few different excursions on port days. And because of this was during the pandemic, we had to book a trip with the cruise line for some of the stops. That was the only way they would even let us off the ship. This is obviously to prevent the spread and make sure that we're only together with other fully vaccinated and tested people. And that was the case here in St. Lucia. Right now I'm making my way through the points that I was talking about before on the pier in St. Lucia. I was about to go on a little trip with a tram train around the port city, the capital Castries, and end up at the beach. Did I mention that the, the sun was um, out? Uh, well, not anymore. It just all of a sudden just started raining heavy just at the second we went inside the building. And uh, now we're about to go <laughs> through an area and it's raining hard right now. Uh, it's, it's kind of still have a bit of sunlight, uh, and I think this rain is not going to last for long. They said on the ship that um, it's um, probably not going to rain today, but you never know with these parts. So uh, grab a poncho on your way out, and, and I did. Uh, so here we are, and yeah, it seems like it's stopping already. Travel is possible at any age. Your sense of adventure is just over the horizon. So reach out. Grab it. 
Hi guys. Hi guys. This is, this is the Radio, the Vagabond. Radio Vagabond Podcast. The cruise line has a team of people planning these excursions. And the team on this celebrity cruise is led by Austrian-born Jennifer Wiener. During sea days, Jennifer was giving presentations in the big theater on the ship to let us know what the options were. I got to know Jennifer, and since she told me that she'd been to almost 100 countries, partly because of her job, I thought I would like to hear more about her traveling life and what it's like working as a senior destination manager on a big cruise ship like this one. Jennifer caught the travel bug at a very young age. Well, very honestly, when I was little, I was very envious of these children I read in books about that were able to go to boarding school and away from home. So I think that's already an indication when it started. I begged my mother to be able to go to boarding school, but she said, no, we love you, you stay around. So I had to stay at home. But with 17, I managed to go to Rome for a few months for studying Italian, which wasn't really necessary because I was fluent already, but I wanted to get out. And that was the beginning of my traveling. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> we'll hear more from Jennifer throughout this episode, but let's get back to St. Lucia and the trip she and the team had planned for us. The trolley is like a, a little train, uh, but we're not on tracks. Uh, it, but it's, it's, yeah, it's a car dressed up as a, a locomotive in, in front. Uh, and then we, there are uh, three uh, carts after that. Uh, but thank God it's got, a, it's got a little roof on. It's still open, but uh, they've got a roof on. So uh, we, we're probably not going to get wet in, uh, <laughs> when it starts raining again. So, Jennifer, you obviously travel a lot. You've been to one country more than me. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So you obviously travel a lot. Tell me a little bit more about your background. You're from Austria. Exactly. I'm from Austria, and I actually started with business school. But then that was a little bit too dry for me. So when I finished that, I went to um, a school for travel agency, and I became a travel agent. And that's when I did some of my travels already. But then I realized the benefits are not good enough to travel as much as I wanted. And somebody told me about cruise ships. And I started cruising as a travel agent. And then I had a weird experience on one cruise with my grandparents. And that's when I decided, you know what, this looks like a fun, so I will apply. And then I applied for cruise ships and I came on board of one of the royal ships as a shore excursion staff. You say weird experience? <laughs> yes, it's actually kind of a funny story. My grandparents and I were traveling. They didn't know I would go on a cruise with them. It was supposed to be a surprise. And the problem was with Venice that the ship couldn't get in to debark and embark people because of the fog. That happens actually in Venice, unfortunately, more than once. Yeah, and uh, the problem was then the cruise line had to change everything around and get to a different port to debark and embark the new guests. And I was a travel agent, as I mentioned back then. And thanks to that, I got a deal to be on one of the earlier buses. And then I was there in Trieste. And nobody spoke German out there. So everybody only spoke Italian from the ship or English. And so I said, listen, if you get me early on board with my grandparents, because they're elderly, I need to get them on board, I will help you and translate. And that was the mistake that I did. And then I had 500 German speakers yell at me. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm also just a guest. <laughs> like, I'm not in charge of doing anything. Yet. Yet. <laughs> But I was like, that was, that was still kind of fun. And my grandmother said, I, I saw that coming. I saw that coming. You enjoyed that way too much. And that's when I applied. That's how I got the idea. That's what I mean, weird experience, because technically I got yelled at. <laughs> and that's when I started to apply. <laughs> so, so how many uh, years have, have you worked on, on cruise ships? Nine years now. Yeah, close to the ten, yeah. When I said you've been to more countries than me, there's 98 countries, you're getting close to the 100? Exactly, I'm getting close to the 100. It's 98 at the moment, but I do not plan to any new countries, at least within this year. So you still have a chance of beating me. I know that a lot of travelers say, I don't even know, but I think I personally think they're lying. But, uh, but for me, it's uh, 100 is, is something special. So have you got anything planned uh, for how to mark that when you're, when you're hitting that 100? 
Unfortunately, actually, no. I think it will just be depending on what country it's going to be, and then I will find something special in that country to do, and that's how I'm going to celebrate the 100th for sure. But no plans there yet. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to St. Lucia. Welcome aboard the trolley train. Okay, um, everyone has given their tickets, yes, to Aysalma. Alrighty. Um, your train operator, this man to the front, is Ernest. You call him Biggie. That's our number one train operator. And your number one conductor, my name Peterson. You, you call me Small. So we got a Biggie Small with you in the house, eh? Okay, now we're on the trolley train here in St. Lucia. Let's just get seven interesting facts about this place. And now, facts about where we are. Castries, where we are right now, is the capital and the largest city in St. Lucia, the island country of the Caribbean. It's a small city in a small country. The urban area has a population of around 20,000. It's built on reclaimed land and it's been rebuilt several times after being destroyed in fires. St. Lucia is tiny. 616 square kilometers, that's 238 square miles, on the list of 193 UN nations after size, it's number 178. So it's smaller than Micronesia and Singapore, and only a little bit bigger than Andorra. The population of the country is 184,000. It's the first country named after a woman, St. Lucie of Syracuse. In fact, it's one of just two countries in the world named after a woman. Do you know what the other one is? Hmm. Ireland. But that's a story for another day. It's an independent UN nation, and they got their independence from Britain in 1979, after ownership of the island had swapped seven times between France and Britain in the 1800s. After 79, it became member of the Commonwealth, and you can still feel a bit of Britain here. They love playing cricket, they drive on the left-hand side of the road, as we do right now, and English is still the official language, even though around 85% of the population also speak St. Lucian Creole. St. Lucia is home to the Piton Mountain Range, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. As the island is small, it's hard to take a picture anywhere in St. Lucia without the two mountain peaks being visible. Like many destinations in the Caribbean, rum is big business in St. Lucia. And the Rousseau region, just south of the capital, is home to 21 different types of rum. St. Lucia has it all, from stunning beaches to mountain peaks, and then most of the country is covered in rainforest. And that was facts about where we are. The Little Yellow Trolley Train is run by a local company here in St. Lucia called Hibiscus Train. And after the tour around the city, with a few stops, like at the cathedral, the minor basilica of the Immaculate Conception, we ended up at the exotic Vigi Beach, just on the other side of the tiny airport. Going on a Caribbean cruise like this and visiting many exotic destinations is so exciting. Imagine having that as a job like Jennifer has. It's a dream job, even though it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work, yes. It is a dream job. It's really great. But it is a, it is a hard job. And of course, I get out much less than I used to in the beginning, especially since I'm a manager now. So, yeah. But my team, I try to give them as many chances as possible. Yeah. <laughs> All of this uh, traveling, has that been a part of your job or is a lot of it on your own as well? I would say 60% is for a job. And also, like I said before, I was a manager. I was going out everywhere and I, had the t and I had the chance for that, of course, as well. But now that I've seen all of those places, I also stay voluntarily then behind and let the team go out and do explore it because I've seen it all already. And 40% is personal, but 
most of those travels are to my favorite continent, Africa. It's so funny that Jennifer mentions Africa. This episode is recorded five months ago when I was doing the cruise. We were talking about how many countries we'd been to, and since then I'd made it to 99 countries. I'm editing this episode in my Airbnb apartment in Nairobi, Kenya. And in just two days, I'm going to make it to my country number 100 when I go to Uganda Friday morning this week. So it's funny to hear that Jennifer mentions this part of the world as her favorite. Coming up later in this episode. Kenya is one of my favorite places ever to travel to. I just fell in love with it and it's just beautiful, it's stunning and I just love falling asleep with all the noises from the wild just outside the tent. I did have some close calls, <laughs> especially in Uganda with a gorilla, however, it's definitely been worth it, yeah. And then we also continue to an island that's the first word in a famous Beach Boys song. That's coming up when the program continues. Stay with us. This week, I'm going to share an email that I received just before Christmas, and it blew my mind. It's from Kenneth, and here's what he writes. Hi, Palabo. It's a great podcast you're producing, and I just got this from Spotify. And then he attaches a picture from Spotify that says, My favorite podcast of the year is The Radio Vagabond. And then it says that he streamed a whopping 5,482 minutes of the Radio Vagabond. That's more than 91 hours. But that's not what blew my mind. It's what comes next in his email. Here goes. You've been a big part of my personal journey. Unfortunately, it's a journey I'm still on. In May, I was hit by stress-related anxiety the serious kind. To get through the hard times, I started listening to your podcast. I've had you in my ears on my long daily walks, and it's helped me control my thoughts, and in this process, I'm still in. Because listening to your exciting podcast, I've been able to focus on something else. In other words, your journey has been a big part of my inner journey, and it will continue to be that in 2022. It's been a tough battle for me, and I hope I'm back to 100% soon. I want you to know that you're one of the people that had helped me to where I am today with your podcast. And for that, I thank you very much. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Keep up the good work. Kenneth. Whew. I can't even begin to express the impact your email had on me, Kenneth. When I started this podcast in 2016, my goal was to give some tips, tricks, and ideas for your next trip to let you follow my journey and maybe also be inspired by my somewhat different life choice. Also, I was hoping to entertain you along the way. But if somebody had told me that this podcast would be playing even just a small part in the recovery of stress-related anxiety, I would have said, yeah, right. And another thing, your email came at a point where I was kind of thinking, wow, I'm spending two, three, four full working days just editing one 30-minute episode. What's the point? Is it really worth the many hours of work I put into this? After reading your email, I got the motivation back. And for that, I thank you, Kenneth. Also, thank you for sharing. Get better soon and keep me posted. You can also send a few lines to Palabo. Tell him where you are and what you're doing right now as you're listening to these words. Just click on contact on theradiovagabond.com and fill out the form. And now, let's get back to the show. While I've been reading this letter from a listener, we've spent the night on the cruise ship and arrived to the Netherlands Antilles, in the southwesternmost part of the Caribbean Sea. More specifically, to the first of the ABC Islands. And this is the island you probably most know from the beginning of this song. Aruba. Yes, Aruba. The other two ABC Islands are Bonaire and Curaçao. 
We don't go to Bonaire on this cruise, so only from A to C. Well, it's good to have you, and it's uh, great to be able to host you here, although only for a few hours, but we're, we appreciate that you uh, take the time to come and visit us. We start in the Ruba with the official slogan, One Happy Island. And the voice you just heard was Mario Arens from Aruba Tourism Authority. My name is Mario Arens. Currently, I'm the cruise manager at the Aruba Tourism Authority, and I dedicate myself to promoting Aruba as a cruise destination. Mm -hmm. We're very close to uh, the Venezuelan coastline, uh, so we're in the southern part of the uh, the Caribbean, uh, but um, and and it's part of the ABC Islands. Well, yeah, we're part of the Dutch Caribbean islands. Originally, the six Caribbean islands, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, St. Martin, Saba, and Stasia, St. Eustatius, were part of the Dutch Antilles. Since 1986, Aruba separated from the Antilles and became an autonomous nation within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Yeah. And then in 2010, Curaçao and St. Martin also did about the same thing and they also separated remained under the kingdom of the Netherlands and Saba, Stasia and Bonaire became like a special province from the Netherlands so a closer relationship with with Holland but still everybody part of the kingdom I guess uh, because I'm from Denmark I guess a little bit like uh, Greenland is a part of the Danish kingdom but still have their own government you, you're, you're basically running yourself or uh, how does it work? Yes, we have uh, our own uh, elected officials and it's done through popular votes. We, through a parliamentarian democracy, so we elect parliament and then from the parliament, the if they get the majority, 12, 11 or more, mm -hmm. they are able to form a government. If not, they have to form a coalition. From there, they get the Uh, executive branch, the mi prime minister is, is the head of the executive branch, but we also have the governor, which is much more kind of a symbolic uh, position, which represents the king of the Netherlands. I know this is an episode about the Caribbean, but let's get back to the conversation with senior destination manager and world traveler Jennifer Wiener. We'll now take a little detour and talk about another part of the world and a part of the world that I just happen to be in right now as I'm editing this episode. Kenya and very soon Uganda. Very, very high on my bucket list now is uh, some of the African countries, uh, specifically Kenya, uh, Uganda, and as far as I know, you've been there. Yes, actually Kenya is one of my favorite places ever to travel to. It's, it's in my heart. It's the favorite one. And I've been to Uganda as well. I, what, is it? what is it about Kenya? I don't know. Maybe it's because it was my first African uh, country. And when I, when I said, I'm going to Kenya, because I met actually a guest on board and she was a guest relation manager in one Kenyan safari lodge. And she said, come to me. And when I told my friends, told me, they're like, yeah, what are you going to do? Run around in high heels in Africa from lions? No. And now I'm going on purpose. And I just fell in love with it. And It's just beautiful, it's stunning, and I just love falling asleep with all the noises from the wild just outside the tent. I did have some close calls, <laughs> especially in Uganda with a gorilla. However, it's definitely been worth it, yeah. But it was not only gorillas in Uganda? No, it was not. Actually, we had one stop, and I was at the... It's not really a... It's called the zoo, but it was more like a rescue area and an orphanage. That's one thing that I like to watch out for, that I don't go to zoos in particular. I go to rescue areas, orphanages, and I do research them, of course, as well, so that they're not fake sanctuaries, for example. So I went to one of those and they said, oh, yes, we also have a behind the scenes program. Would you like to do it? It just costs extra. And I was standing there like, take my money <laughs> and take me behind the scenes. And I actually have a picture where I kiss a giraffe. I did feed some baby elephants that unfortunately due to the... Um, problems with the collection of the task lost their mother and then I ended up in the hospital and I ended up petting a cheetah and was, was it a, an animals hospital or it was pretty much um, all of the new animals when they get rescued they have to first go to the hospital be checked out and some have to do a little bit of quarantine um, to get used to everything around them and 
that's my favorite story as well because I was there and then they say like oh yes we have two cheetahs they're just one year old and I was like oh babies and then they come out no they're not babies anymore with one year they're pretty much grown up from the looks of him so wow they're really cute and then he opens that gate and says yeah go in and pet them I'm like are you crazy you just rescued them last week and you want me to go inside and pet the cheetah and it's like yeah 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 go in there go in there and I'm like well okay if he says it's fine so I went in the cage with the wild cheetahs and the female just looked at me was like nah not interested goes away and actually the male then looked at me jumped up on a chair sat down and was like I'm ready to be pet now and that's what I did that gave me a hug and I was like okay I'm petting a cheetah I'm petting a cheetah I'm really doing this and he started licking my hand as well and it's I don't know, that feeling was incredible because it's really like sandpaper over your skin. It kind of hurts, but it was so cool. Kind of like a cat. Yeah, exactly, but really much, much rougher than that. <laughs> it really feels like sandpaper over your hand. I was like, okay, I might have lost some skin right there, but it was definitely worth it. And then he started licking my shirt as well, and the gentleman said, like, oh, no, he's not allowed to do that. And I was like, what am I supposed to do? like push them away and say bad kitty I'm not gonna do that with a cheetah <laughs> but I do have a very cute picture of that and that's my favorite memory actually from Uganda <laughs> have you ever wondered what the places in this podcast actually look like I have so I started following the Radio Vagabond on Instagram simply by searching Radio Vagabond Dutch is still uh, one of the official languages am I right Correct. We have two official languages at the moment. One is Dutch and our own language, which is called Papiamento. Am I right to assume that uh, tourism is by far the, the biggest industry? By far, by far. Uh, um, I, I would say over 85% of our GDP is, comes directly or indirectly of tourism. So you took a big hit uh, in, in, uh, in the pandemic? Yes, uh, we did. Um, we op reopened our borders on June 1st last year. Uh, for Europe and June 10th for the American markets and ever since we've been we've been uh, open we haven't had any lockdowns obviously the measures change according to the situation but yeah I mean it, it's it's been a very hard economic hit for us we are proud though that we we've been able to recuperate relatively faster than um, many other islands and we feel fortunate in that sense Walking through uh, Orangestad, which is, sounds so wonderfully Dutch, <laughs> it can't be more Dutch than that. Walking through, I, I, I feel that this is in some ways more modern than many of the other uh, Caribbean islands I've visited. Um, what do you say to that? Well, you know, I think we're very fortunate to have the, the lifestyle, the, the standard of living that we have. And we... And we attribute to that in um, throughout our history to different industries. Right now, for about 50, over 50 years, tourism has been one of the, if not the most important activity uh, for our economy. But we've had in the past, the oil industry has been very important to us. Before that, we had aloe. Um, we had uh, gold that was part of our history. So we are very fortunate. And um, yeah, I mean, it's not, I wouldn't want to compare to other islands because everybody is different, mm -hmm. but we are, we feel that we are fortunate to be able to enjoy what we have and invest in things that are important, you know, and obviously tourism helps us develop in terms of education, healthcare and other things. Yeah. And I've, I've seen it so many signs here that uh, your official slogan is uh, the happy place. Exactly, one happy island. That's so that's our island, correct. Island. Yeah, that's been our that's been our uh, tagline for many many years. And even though I can't see it with the mask on, I feel that you're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one thing about uh, you know. I think if if uh, if in this, this last one year and a half, you, we've learned to recognize people despite the mask and also read the eyes. And I think uh, obviously when you are smiling. The eyes become a little bit smaller, and that indicates that somebody is smiling, yes. You are listening to The Radio Vagabond, your guide to taking that first step towards living a more fulfilling and adventurous life. If Palabo can do it, 
Why can't you? So for people who really want to travel, obviously, a good tip would be to get a job on a cruise ship. But what would you say to people who want to get out there and maybe think, oh, it's a dangerous world out there? Well, of course, be smart when you travel. Don't put yourself in any risks. Um, in certain countries, I always recommend, and also when I was a travel agent, I always recommend group travels. If you want to see as much as possible in a short time, then cruises is the way to go because you go to several countries in a week or in 14 days. And we do have a lot of great tours also on those cruises so you can see the most in one day. And most people do that also too when they decide, okay, I want to come back then. I went on an itinerary, I loved all of these islands, but you know what? Aruba was the best one, for example, so I will come back here for a whole week and explore more. So that is a really great way to go. And also, as we can hear now, a lot of entertainment on the ship. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's a lot of things going on on board if you don't want to get out, but I think that's not that smart. Only stay on board on the sea days and the rest of the time get out and explore, but I'm biased, you know. <laughs> and you're on Instagram? I am on Instagram, yes, exactly. It's actually Lady Jen Adventures because I do have a ladyship title from Scotland and I found... You are not kidding. Wow. <laughs> yes, I got one of those titles. I, w I would have dressed up if I'd known. <laughs> I, do, I do, did get one of those titles. Um, I used it mainly for buying some land to plant trees on it because that's another thing that I do like to do when I travel around. I like to bring supplies to schools I like to be part of environmental tours when I travel personally, plant trees wherever I can. So, but then one of those trees that were planted in my name pretty much came with the perk of having an official certificate naming me a lady. So that's why I put it on my Instagram. <laughs> Great talking to you, Jennifer, and uh, I'm so glad we met. I'm glad we met too. It was fun. So once we get here, whether it's just a day on a cruise ship or it's a longer stay uh, what are some of the highlights that uh, people should look for here in Aruba well you know there are different things I mean obviously one of the things that Aruba is well known is for the beach experience we have here uh, some of the most beautiful beaches in the in the region beaches like Eagle Beach or Palm Beach have been frequently named uh, among the top 10 most beautiful beaches in the world But, you know, obviously there's much more, although Aruba is not big, but we are offering also other experiences, uh, um, not only linked to the sea, but there are other things like uh, culture, nature, in terms of tracking, in terms of hiking. We have a national park that's about a fifth of our territory. Mm -hmm. So we have different things that we can do aside from just the beach. Like you said, it's a fairly small island, so it's quickly to get around and, uh, and and see the whole thing and you can't really get lost no it's impossible to get lost well, one of the anecdotes is that you know we have a trade wind here a and what? a trade winds uh -huh. so there is we have this tree that's called the DV tree and I always tell people if you get lost in the Mundi and the countryside you, if you find a DV tree you see where it's pointing and you just follow that direction and you get back to this side of the island so that's a, a natural way to find your way But it's so small, it's, it's very difficult to get lost. Yeah. And, and tomorrow I'm going to Curaçao, uh, which is a part of these uh, three ABC islands. How is that different uh, uh, than Aruba? Uh, well, I think for somebody maybe that's not very familiar, you would say it's very, very similar. But, you know, if you really um, look at closer, you will see a lot of differences. Curaçao is also a spectacular island. In terms of the culture and the architecture, it's, it's beautiful. And we, I mean, it's our sister island, so we really appreciate, yeah. you know, every, so we can enjoy something. Of course, we want Curaçao, Bonaire, and, and, you know, other islands to, to have that as well. So I think you can't go wrong in Curaçao. I mean, you've, you've been here, so we appreciate that you are also going to Curaçao. The Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. I've reached a second island in the Dutch Antilles. Um, it's a part of uh, the Dutch Kingdom, but uh, they have their own independence. And actually, they still have gilden here as their, their currency, which was, was, was used in the Netherlands before the euro came. And uh, I'm standing on the oldest pontoon bridge in the world. 
it's as far as I remember was built in 1888 and uh, it opens it swings open several times a day when boats need to go through uh, that's why they they call it uh, the swinging old lady and the houses here are on both sides are very colorful and and very beautiful architecture uh, on on my right side there are uh, a line of buildings that kind of reminds me of uh, Newhound in Copenhagen where they have small colorful houses and um, restaurants and bars uh, along the shoreline and a few boats. It's very iconic for Copenhagen but also here it's it's really really beautiful and um, looks like a very historical beautiful um, uh, town here. And there's in one of the houses it's a pink house and the sign says the blue experience and I've just been told that that uh, is a good place to visit because they have a lot of the Curacao liquors uh, with uh, with different colors and uh, I was told that's quite an experience so let's head over there. We walk across the swinging old lady to the other side. It turned out that the blue experience was closed pandemic you know so instead i walked around on the pier and right there was a group of guys laughing and telling jokes in a language i didn't understand i, I feel something funny is going on but i don't understand a hey, word that's our local language so what what, what local I'm, I'm doing a podcast uh, what is the local language papiamento papiamento can you can you teach me something that i should know in papiamento okay papiamento now you are with four or five people from Curacao. Beautiful gentlemen. Beautiful gentlemen. We are just teasing each other. Yes. We are teasing each other, joking, and have fun because now we have rainfall and they are waiting for the tourists to come and to bring them somewhere for a tour. And that's why we are making some jokes. <laughs> but what? Uh, how do I say thank you very much in... Uh, Masha Danke. Masha Danke. Masha Danke. Okay, so it's got to be a bit bon of a Dutch... Bombini. Bombini bon na Corso. Okay. Welcome to Curaçao. Okay. Bombini na Corso. So you, you don't say Curaçao, you say Corsao. Corso. Bombini na Corso. <laughs> And then I say, Masha Danke. Masha Danke. Masha Danke. You are welcome. Bit, it sounds a little bit Dutch. Yes, uh, Dutch. Masha, 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 Masha Danke. Danke. Masha Danke. Danke. Uh, what's your name? My name is Ransley Winkler. What is the good thing about living in, in Curaçao? No, living in Curaçao, you have good food, friendly people, and lovely person. Yeah. And yeah. everything you want, you have to ask, you get it. Yeah. They, we were in Aruba yesterday, and they have the slogan that they're the happy island. Are, are you also the I happy I don't compare Aruba <laughs> with us. Ruba can use this word. I use my words. Dushi Karsau. Dushi Karsau. Once and for all. Masha Danke. Masha Danke. I got it. Masha Danke. <laughs> Bombini. <laughs> Passa bona tarde. Thank you guys. You're welcome. We're coming to the end of my visit to Curacao and coming to the end of the Caribbean cruise and to the end of this episode that was supported in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best deals on hotel rooms, guest houses, and hostels all over the world in one simple search. Just go to Hotels25.com. It's best price guaranteed. I do have a little bit more from this cruise in a few days when I have an interesting conversation with another avid world traveler who's been to 96 countries. He's also a part of the Celebrity Cruise team, and I see him almost all the time on stage. Here is how I introduce him in the episode that's coming up. Okay, you're about to meet a man who talks a lot. He's got a lot of words. He's a public speaker, comedian, quiz master, magician, mind reader, DJ. Some people call him a genius dancer. I think that's debatable. He's an avid traveler and has been to 96 countries. And then I've heard people that refer to him as... One of the most entertaining things to come out of Wales since Tom Jones. His name is Eddie Jenkins, but here on the cruise ship we all know him as uh, cruise director Eddie. Thank you very much. I think that was, uh, well, uh, only my mother could have written that intro, I think. There were so many compliments. She that. did. That's very nice of her. She's a lovely woman. You'd like her. You really don't want to miss this conversation. Eddie is such a great guest. It's in your podcast app in a few days. My name is Pella and I gotta keep moving. See ya. Produced by Radio Guru.
www.co.uk.